In 1961, a man named Edward Lawrence was uh, running c numerical computer simulations on the weather. And as he was doing so, looking at how uh, different things work out in weather prediction, he wanted to take a closer look at something that he had uh, run before, a calculation that he'd done before. And so he, he entered in the, the same values again, except this time, instead of entering the condition 0 0.506, he entered, or sorry, he, he did that, 0 0.506, instead of 0 0.506127. Uh, now, if you're familiar with math at all, you know that the difference between those two numbers is exceedingly small. Uh, it, it's down to, to, what is that? That's just over one ten thousandth of one. Very, very small number. And he expected that everything would turn out the same. But what he found is that it actually turned out to be a very different scenario. In fact, the weather patterns turned out completely different over time. As Lawrence wrote, the differences more or less steadily doubled in size every four days or so until all resemblance with the original output disappeared. The numbers were rounded off values and they were steadily amplifying until they dominated the situation. Later on, in 1963, he published a theoretical study called Deterministic Non-Periodic Flow, and I guarantee you that's the last big word that I'm going to use in this message without explaining it further. Elsewhere, as he was speaking with people, he stated that one flap of a seagull's wings would be enough to alter the course of weather forever. And following his colleague's suggestion in later speeches, he used the more poetic butterfly. See, today we know his theory is the butterfly effect, the idea that a butterfly fly flapping its wings in one place might create tiny changes in the atmosphere that will totally change whether or not a tornado happens and the size of the tornado and where the tornado happens somewhere completely different. See, his theory is, is that given enough time, even the smallest thing can make a great impact. And the same is true in our lives. Given enough time, even the smallest person, even the smallest action can have a great impact in the world. See, I know that a lot of us, we, we come here you know, to church or we're at home watching online and, and we just think about ourselves in kind of these small terms, right? We think uh, of the things that we'd like to do in life and we say, I'm not, I'm not good enough for that. I don't, I don't have what it takes for that. Others of us don't have that problem. That's a different message that we're not going to get into today. But maybe it is that God has given you a dream in your, in your heart that you look at it and you go, there is no way that that can happen anytime soon. Have you ever been there? You, you look at something that you feel like God wants you going into and not only do you feel too small to be able to accomplish it, but you think there's no way that I can accomplish that in my lifetime. See, we today are coming to the last message in this series we've been on for the last uh, four or five weeks called Chase the Lion. And in this message series, we've been talking about how God lays on our hearts dreams that are a lot like the 500-pound lion that one of David's mighty men named Benaiah chased into a pit on a snowy day and killed. And we've been talking about the fact that, that when God lays these dreams that seem impossible and scary on our hearts, we have to recognize that we're not in it alone, but that we have God on our side, that he's helping us through these things. We have to recognize that when we're passionate about Jesus, we're going to have the, the courage to be able to move forward and not give up, that we are going to have to partner with God, that he likes it when we get involved and actually do something to make dreams happen while relying on the fact that he comes in and, and is strong when we're, we're not. We talked about the fact that there's going to be sacrifices that need to be made as we pursue these dreams. But then we still come to this place where we say, Pastor Stephen, the dream is too big. Pastor Stephen, I'm too small. I can't do this. Today, what I want all of us to recognize is that the key to dreaming big is thinking long even beyond your own lifetime. 
uh, if you have a, a pen and paper here and wanted to write that down, this is the, the key thing. Like if you forget the rest of the message, will you just remember this thing? If you've got a mobile device here that's internet connected, you can go to ASCC.life, tap on the message notes tile and follow along with the message there and take your notes, save them for later so that you can come back to this and, and be reminded that the key to dreaming big is thinking long, even beyond your lifetime. Let me explain a little bit about what I mean here. See, things in your life, they can look too big for you. And maybe it is that, that you can't even finish it in your lifetime. But then if somebody else, somebody of the next generation looks at what you've been doing, maybe they catch a spark. Maybe they pick up the dream and they start to say, you know what, I, I can do that. Maybe God hands the dream to them. Maybe it is that, that as you work towards things that, that you com completely seem to fail and that after you've given up on it all or you've gotten too old or you've retired or whatever it is, that somebody's flipping through some historical documents and they happen to come across one sentence where you're mentioned where the thing that you were trying to do that God had laid on your heart happens and they go, wow. And suddenly God lays on their heart your dream. See, it's like a dream within a dream. One place that we can see this principle, the key to dreaming big is thinking long even beyond your lifetime, is in genealogies. I know that they are everyone's favorite part of the Bible. If you've spent any time reading the Bible at all, you know, if you're like me, you get to the genealogy and you're like, yes, score, today God is going to do something powerful in my life because I get to read that so-and-so begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so and did this little tiny thing who begat this person and they married this person and lived for this long before begatting this person and this person and this person. Exciting stuff. I love it. Like that, that there, you know, if, if the whole Bible was genealogies, you'd just never fall asleep. It's that riveting, right? I think it's, this is big stuff. But here's the thing is even as we look at these genealogies and in all seriousness, most of us start to doze off and we think why on earth are people starting the story of Jesus off with a genealogy? Like, this isn't exciting. We're talking about the most exciting thing ever to happen. And what do we do? We start with a list of people who had people who had people who had people. But this here, this is the key to what we see in this place. Because each of these people did something that we look at and say, yeah, everybody can do that pretty much. Right? Like, whatever. Not a big deal. But all these little things over the course of history, over the scope of history, have a lasting and humongous impact. I think as I, I read these genealogies about a widowed woman from outside of the community, poor, had to go out and work on farmers' fields, collecting the scraps that they left behind. And yet, she's in these genealogies. This, this woman who you would look at and you would say, well, she's no big deal. But there's Ruth in the genealogies, this woman who isn't of the people of Israel, and yet she's in an Israelite line, and we see that Ruth and Boaz lead to King David. A woman who, by all accounts, you would look at and say, eh, who cares? Is someone who had a lasting impact because of longevity. And let me tell you that through Ruth, and through David, we then come to the Savior of the world in Jesus Christ. See, the key to dreaming big is thinking long, even beyond your lifetime. And so you may think that the little things that you do now don't matter, but they do. You may think that today doesn't matter and that you can go and do whatever needs to be done today because you always got tomorrow, but today turns into tomorrow. And when tomorrow becomes today, are you going to throw that away too? The key to dreaming big is thinking long, even beyond your lifetime. But here's the thing, friends. When you act based on a short-term outlook, which if you're like me, you do way too much, you're going to mess up. I think that just about every mistake that we make in our lives, and be honest with you, is because we start thinking short-term. We don't think about what are the repercussions of this action going to be later on in my life. But we just focus in on how it feels now, don't we? 
We say, if I go and, and you know, marriage is a long way out. I don't know that I want to commit to that, but I really like the idea of the marriage bed. And so let's just jump into the marriage bed. And then you end up with pregnancies. You end up recognizing that, that there, things aren't what you thought that they were, that there wasn't a commitment involved here. Or you go and, and you start to think to yourself, you know what? I really, really would like that thing. It's a really good thing. It would really help me. But I don't have the money right now. And see, a long view says, so maybe I should save. Short-term view says, charge it. Or a short-term view says, I got it. But as we've seen in the financial crises that have been happening since 2008 around the world, that this viewpoint, this short-term outlook has long-term consequences that aren't very fun. Or anybody that's ever shoplifted and, and has been caught has found out that there are lasting long-term consequences when you only think short-term. We've been looking at uh, a book called Second Samuel. It's in the Old Testament of the Bible. And specifically, we've been in chapter 23 looking at David's mighty men. And these are some pretty fantastic guys. With God's help, as they caught the dream of, of following David and seeing David, uh, who was God's anointed one, raised to power to his rightful place as king of Israel, they got behind him and they did some amazing things, standing alone, some of them, against armies. And God protected them and, and enabled them to overcome. And, and today I, I want to focus in on something that most of us, if we're reading 2 Samuel chapter 23, we'd actually stop before this. Because see, when we read about Benaiah and the lion, or Benaiah and the giant, or we read about Joshua and the Philistine army, or we read about, about David saying, hey, I'm really thirsty, and then his guys sneaking behind enemy lines and grabbing water. We read these things, and we're like, these are awesome stories. And then we get to, to verse 24. Other members of the 30 included Asahel, Joab's brother, Elhan, son of Dodo from Bethlehem, Shammah from Herod, Elka from Herod. And we get bored, and we stop reading. But what happens is we miss one of the most profound things in this passage, and that comes at the very end of this list of the mighty, of the mighty men. In, in verse 39, we read, Uriah the Hittite. There were 37 in all. Now, if you spent a lot of time in church, you may be familiar with this guy, Uriah the Hittite. But in case you're not, in case, in case it's been a little while, here's what we see. In the midst of this listing of the most loyal people to David is a reminder that David, a, a man after God's own heart, did not always think long-term. That he thought short-term. See, as it was, eventually David became king of Israel, and, and we are told in Scripture that one day, as, as the time came for kings to go out to war, David sends his army out, and he stays home. I don't know why he stayed home. But what I do know is that one day he decided that he was going to go out on his roof and in Palestine, especially in that day and age, you had these nice flat roofs. Maybe there were gardens or other things that you could hang out just to, to have some fun in the sun, right? And so he's out on, on his palace roof and all of a sudden he's looking along over the city that he rules and he happens to see a beautiful young woman who happens to be in a certain state of complete undress. And then gets into her bath and she starts to bathe and, and he continues to look at this woman. And so eventually he, he calls over one of his servants. You know things are getting bad when you're staring at a naked woman and then you call over one of your servants and you're like, hey, come over here. And he says, who is that woman? The servant comes back and he says, uh, that's Bathsheba. She's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, if, if you've never read 2 Samuel 23, verse 39, you may be thinking, well, David doesn't care. The Hittite, he's not even an Israelite. Like, David doesn't really know this guy, and he's interested in the woman. He's king after all, so he can just go and do whatever he wants. But what we see is that Uriah the Hittite is one of David's mighty men. David knows who Uriah is, and yet he hears Uriah the Hittite, and what does he do? Does he say, oh, wow, you know, maybe we need to, to buy him some curtains, no, he says, bring her to me. 
Now, we don't need to get into what happened there. Read between the lines. Especially since, you know, she comes back maybe a month later and says, so, um, David, a certain thing didn't happen. <clears throat> I think I'm pregnant. And David suddenly has this panic. Like, what was short-term might have some long-term consequences. What are the mighty men going to think if while they're off fighting their king's war, he's off taking what's theirs into his bed? What are the people of Israel going to think about God's anointed? So David enacts a plan. He, he's like, hey, go get Uriah to come home. Bring him home. I need a report from the battlefield. And so Uriah comes home, and David sits him down. He's like, hey, how you doing, buddy? Tell me about how things are going. And, and, and then after dinner, he's like, you know what? That was a great report. Since you're here anyways, I bet you that your wife, Bathsheba, don't ask me how I know her name, you know, but your wife, she, she would really like a visit from you. Why don't you just go home and be with your wife? And Uriah says, I could never, while my friends and brothers in arms are on the battlefield away from their wives, go home and be with my wife. Now there's honor slapping the king in the face. So David's a little bit frustrated. And so the next day he comes and, and he's like, Uriah, come over here. And he gets Uriah drunk. He's like, if I get the guy drunk, surely. And he sends him home. And he gets up in the morning and he opens the door and Uriah is there sleeping on the porch. Didn't go home. Now, as you can imagine, this is a problem for somebody that does not want to be caught. And so he devises an interesting plan. He tells the leader of the army, hey, you know what? Um, when Uriah goes to the front there, back to, to fight, I want you to put him in the place where the action is the most fierce, where the enemies are the strongest. I want you to put him right in the very front lines. And then here's what you're going to do. Once the battle heats up, I want everyone to take a couple steps back, but keep him in the front. So as you can imagine, Uriah didn't come home. David committed murder, and he thought he got away with it until, until God sent Nathaniel, Nathan, one of those, prophet, to confront him because God knew what he'd done. See, David thinking short-term had long-term repercussions. David thinking short-term actually brought about more short-term thinking that caused him a whole lot of other problems, and that child was lost. But David ended up bringing Bathsheba into his home as his wife. But what I find so interesting about this story and about this listing of the mighty men is that, that here you have one of the most loyal men in David's life becoming the man whose character stands in stark contrast to David's in David's darkest hour. See, David wasn't thinking long and he fell. And maybe there's things in your life that you haven't thought long about, that you've just thought about now, and you're starting to feel the consequences of those things coming along, or the guilt, the shame. See, friends, the key to dreaming big is thinking long, even beyond your lifetime. But when you act based on a short-term outlook, you're going to mess up. But here is the great hope of the gospel. It's that Jesus came despite your mistakes and he overcame them at the cross. See, you messed up. All of us messed up. Humanity decided that even though we had the, a good thing going with God in the garden, that God was walking with us in the cool of the day. We're buddy-buddy with the guy who, who made us. Buddy-buddy with the king of the universe. We said, you know what? This isn't good enough. I want more. I want to be like God. So humanity rebelled against God, disobeyed him, and in that moment, the curse of sin and death entered into the world, corrupted all that was good in the world that God had created. That's the reason why when you look around at this beautiful world, you open the paper and you see just the, the nastiness of all that's going around in life. It's because of humanity's sin. See, sin is when we don't live up to what God made us to be. Sin is when we miss the mark on who we were made to be. 
It's when we injure the heart of God by disobeying him. In fact, you could say since God created the universe and, and we're told he's the king of kings, the king of the universe, our rejection of him is a, a committing of treason. And the punishment for treason is death. And we, we notice this in our, our everyday life as we feel separated and alone from God. And yet here's the thing is that Jesus, God come in human flesh, living an innocent life as he died on that cross, as humanity nailed the one that came to save them to a tree. In that moment, Jesus took on himself all your shame. He took on himself all your sin, all the burdens that you bear, all the mistakes that you've made because of your short-term thinking, because of my short-term thinking. He takes on himself all these things. And he says, listen, I've borne it all. I've paid the price for it all. I've taken the separation that you and God had. This is Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he refers to Psalm 22, he calls us to recognize what he's done for us, that he has brought us life, that he has given us a pathway through his innocent blood being shed to be in a relationship with God the Father. He lets us recognize that he loves us and that if we'll only turn away from the things that we used to do, the things that maybe we really like doing, but then we find out that there's consequences that aren't so good. When we turn from those things and we run into the arms of Jesus, when we trust in him and his gift of life, then we experience resurrection as Christ experienced resurrection. See, three days after Jesus died, he rose again. Despite the fact that there were all these soldiers around and despite the fact that they knew that he was dead and that they posted these guards and put the stone over top of the tomb and sealed it all up, Jesus rose to life and he exited the tomb. And now he stands before the Father on our behalf. And in fact, we're told that when we begin to follow Jesus, we die to sin, we die to our old identity. Whatever it is that you say, I'm, I'm a teacher, I'm a student, you know, I'm single, I'm married. Anything that we hold in ourselves as an identity, the truth is when we come to follow Jesus, our identity is remade and we are now in Christ. And all those mistakes that you and I make, frankly, on a day-to-day -day basis, Jesus overcame those mistakes in the larger scope of eternity. See, where you think short, Jesus thinks long. He forgives you. Jesus came despite your mistakes and overcame them at the cross. You don't want to know what's so amazing. David messes up with Bathsheba. Short-term mistake. It should be the end. And yet in those begat, 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 begat things, we come to find out that the God allows David and Bathsheba to have a long-term impact. It's Jesus, the Savior of the world, comes to the earth. See, we think, no, the jig's up. David messed up. God, God can't love him. God can't use him. He messed up. God said, out of your imperfection will come perfection. And I'll save the world. See, when you act based on a short-term outlook, you're going to mess up. But Jesus came despite your mistakes. And he overcame them at the cross. And now the key to dreaming big is thinking long, even beyond your own lifetime. What we have to recognize is that our actions now lead to bigger things later on. Our inaction now leads to bigger things later on. That word that you speak to someone on the street or that look that you give them where, you know, that look that you give, if someone's coming along, and, oh yeah, that guy, okay, we're moving on. That cuts to their bone. And as those looks begin to compile in their lives, they build an identity around those lies and you tear down one of God's creation. Or that word that you speak to someone who's looking like they're down on their luck and you tell them Jesus loves you, that 
births something in their heart that over time and over a number of interactions begins to grow into something greater. And maybe it is that it doesn't birth in their own life, but they tell someone else, you know what, it's the weirdest thing. This person came to me and they said, Jesus loves me. And that person goes, wait, does Jesus love me too? And they begin to seek for something greater. See, we don't know how the smallest little look, the smallest word can impact somebody down the line. But the big thing is, is that no matter how small we think that today and this moment is, if we begin to think long, then the dream gets big. Benaiah chased a lion into a pit on a snowy day and ended up David's bodyguard. He probably thought that that was pretty great. I'm bodyguard to the king. But then when everybody turned against David's son Solomon, Benaiah stood by him and found himself not only protector of David and thus of Jesus, but also of Solomon and therefore Jesus' adopted father. And he found himself then the leader of Solomon's army. See, the dream that God has laid on your heart, it may be scary, it may not make sense. It may seem impossible right now and you, and you may think, I, I just don't get it. I don't think I can do it. But your faithful obedience to Jesus' calling will launch you into a partnership with him that accomplishes the purpose that God has for you in his long, eternal plan. So today, whether you're someone that's thinking that you just want to seize today and, and not let another day turn into yesterday and not think that, well, tomorrow is going to come. Or maybe you're here and you're just like, I've got a dream on the horizon and it seems big. Or maybe you're here and you're just thinking, God can't use me because look at me. Then you need to know, friends, the key to dreaming big is thinking long. If a butterfly flapping its wings can impact a tornado Maybe, just maybe, one of God's beloved creations, human creations, whom he considered worthy enough to die for, to bring you life, can have an impact too. So here's my hope for you this week. Begin to dream big. Dream long. Put everything in the scope of eternity as you go out and chase lions. Don't let that roar scare you or push you back, but push through the fear knowing that when God gives you impossible things, you're not alone, but that he's with you. That he gives you those impossible things because in the impossible, God is glorified, not you. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you today that we can look to you in these impossible situations and that you recognize what we are capable of, Lord God, and you recognize that we are capable of so much more than we give ourselves credit for, especially when we put our trust in you and go with you, Jesus. And so today, wherever we're at, I just ask that you'll help us to, to approach each day understanding that you're at work, and that because you are at work, that today has a greater state, stake than we think that our lives, as short and, and small as they may be in the grand scheme of eternity, have an eternal impact. So God, build us up today. Lord, reveal to us the plans that you have for us. All around this room, if you just want to uh, be thinking right now and praying right now, asking God to help you overcome these things, asking God to give you a long outlook, asking God to lay a dream on your heart and to show you what the next step in that dream is. I want to speak to anyone that's here or online today that hears about Jesus and you're thinking, you know, I've made mistakes, but, but is it true? Will, will Jesus forgive me? Will Jesus bring me life? Is there a hope of eternity with God? Pastor Stephen, are, are you telling me the truth when you say that through Jesus, the, the king of the universe wants to adopt me as his son or daughter? Let me tell you, Yes, I'm telling you the truth. And all around this place, there may be people here or online who the Holy Spirit is talking to you right now and saying, come to me, accept Jesus, enter into his life. And if that's you right now, I want to give you the opportunity to give your life 
to Jesus, to have a personal relationship with him in cooperation with the church as the body of Christ. And so I'm going to invite you to pray a prayer with me this morning. And this prayer is not a, a, a little magical little phrase or anything like that that saves you somehow. But what it is, is it's an acknowledgement, a commitment to God of the work that's happening inside of you. And so if today you want to give your life to Jesus and have him make you new, and have an identity founded in Christ, will you pray this prayer after me? Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that I deserve the consequence of my sin. But thank you for dying to save me. And thank you for rising to life so that I can be free from bondage to sin, death, and Satan. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Make me new from the inside out. Lord Jesus, I trust in you and you alone. It's my master my Savior. Help me to leave my old ways behind and now to run into your arms. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time today or the, uh, if you renewed your commitment to God after maybe you, you weren't sure what you'd done before and you're coming back to him now, there's a blue card in the seat back in front of you. It says, I have decided. I would love for you to fill that out or if you're online to go to ASCC.life and tap on the Get Connected tile and fill that out. Let us know what you have decided here today because the Christian life is not meant to be lived alone, but it's something that we're called into together. That is why we're called the body of Christ. You've entered into something that is a part of a greater whole. And so let us help you learn what it is to follow Jesus. Thanks, everyone.